Hello everyone, I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today we're honored to have the lead of the Breast Oncology Program from the UT Health San Antonio MD Anderson Cancer Center Program, Dr. Virginia Kaklamani. In our discussion today, we're hoping that Dr. Kaklamani will walk us through her treatment algorithm for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Virginia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Rahul. It's a pleasure to be here. Virginia, welcome. First of all, congratulations on phenomenal San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium for 2023. Thank you. Uh, it was exciting to see all the data presented. It was exciting to see everybody there, honestly, and uh, everybody was was smiling. To me, that was the, <laughs> the dynamic that I was standing up uh, uh, where we have our little lounge and I was looking down and everybody kept walking around smiling. So to me, that was the best part. Especially because the science is changing so much and it's just benefiting our patients so much. So it, it is smiling faces indeed. So diving into our first area here, which is the localized or early stage breast cancer. Again, our focus is to go over some of the common scenarios from community oncology perspective. Virginia, your take here on the early stage. So early stage, we were, we want to differentiate between pre and postmenopausal. So let me start with postmenopausal because things are so much easier there. Um, we will typically have a genomic score, which will tell us low risk versus high risk. I personally like using the uh, 21 gene recurrence score. And um, any anytime we use that score, if we have a, a patient that has one to three positive lymph nodes or less, uh, then we decide whether a score is 26 or more or one to 25, whether they are candidates for chemotherapy. So that decision is pretty, pretty, pretty easy there. Now, if they have four or more positive disease uh, uh, lymph nodes in any setting, whether they're pre or postmenopausal, th those patients are going to be offered, unfortunately, chemotherapy, and then depending on menopausal status, uh, ovarian suppression or not. Now, in the premenopausal patients, a little bit different, they're a little more complicated, because here we have some nuances as far as the the twenty one gene recurrence score. If we have node positive disease then we start talking about uh, chemotherapy. And that was data from the Rx Bonder trial showing that regardless of, of what the oncotype score is, patients that have no positive disease that are premenopausal are going to benefit from, from chemotherapy. We can talk about whether chemotherapy acts as ovarian suppression or not, but the data we have to date is that. In the node negative uh, disease, then again, the 21 gene recurrence score is looked at as low intermediate risk or high risk. Patients with a score of 26 or more are going to get chemotherapy. Patients with a score of probably 1 to either 16 or 20 are likely not going to need chemotherapy. Uh, the 21 to 25, uh, many of these patients will probably get a, a, a substantial benefit from chemotherapy and we recommend it. And what I typically do in that case is if, if you go to the website for the 21 gene recurrence score, there is a, a RX clin that, uh, that, they, that they calculate, and you can calculate that, and that gives you the absolute benefit of chemotherapy. And then you can talk to your patient and say, hey, there's a 4% absolute benefit. What would you like to do? And then they get to decide. Ovarian suppression is given to our higher risk patients, and the way most of the guidelines uh, talk about that is are the candidates for chemotherapy? If yes, then they also are high enough risk that they should be considered for ovarian suppression. And then we talk about a CDK46 inhibitor. We have data with the abamacycline. We have some data with ribocycline as well, where our a little higher risk patients will benefit from a CDK46 inhibitor. And obviously, if they're BRCA positive, uh, then they would be ben uh, they would be eligible for PARP inhibitor with a lab. Virginia, thank you so much for covering that. Clinical trials such as Tilarex or Rx Ponder have given us these tools so that we're not over treating some of our patients so that not everyone's getting chemotherapy. And you've touched upon it that when it comes to pre or perimenopausal women, there are a lot of nuances. Is there any scenario where you would consider giving ovarian function suppression over chemotherapy in a pre or perimenopausal node positive patient. Because in community, at times we see these patients and the oncotype was ordered by the surgeon and now it's low and you're stuck with that number. I think there is. I think this is where we use our, our judgment. There's an NRG trial that is uh, that is uh, going on that'll address 
this exact issue. Is chemotherapy acting as an ovarian suppression method or is it not? Um, so I think probably in the lower risk node positive patients that are maybe a little older in age, and we're talking about young patients anyway, but maybe the mid to late 40s, where they're likely going to go into menopause anyway, do we really want to give chemotherapy to these patients or can we do ovarian suppression? But the other thing to take into account is we're talking about a, a three to four month duration of chemotherapy versus a five year duration of ovarian suppression. So which one's easier? And, and, and in many cases, it's easier to get through those three months. Patients are motivated. They know they have to do this and they do it. Whereas if we put them on a monthly shot, within six or so months, they will come back and they'll miss a dose. They'll miss another dose. They'll give up. And then you have not optimally treated them. And then it's too late to go back to chemotherapy. Thanks for mentioning that, especially about the ovarian function suppression. We tend to rely on gosrelin. Now, there is questionable data with luprolide. Do you utilize that at all? Because it gives the option of subcutaneous as well as slightly longer term uh, shot preference there. So there's data with both, and 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 I, and I would use either of the two. A lot of times the decision is financial. The institution will come to us and say, you know, this is our preferred agent. Is that okay? And, and then we use that. There's some data with Luprolide on, on Q3 months, and it seems to be um, safe as far as hormonal levels, but not a lot of data. And, and the softened texts were done with monthly injections. So I typically rely on my monthly injections unless a patient will come and say, hey, I really can't do it. But a lot of times if I switch to the three months, I have to watch symptoms I may have to check estradiol levels, which I typically don't like to do. Uh, some of my colleagues are, yes, we check all the time, and some of them say, oh, I never check. So you'll never see a standard. Uh, we need more data in, in, in this in this scenario, and hopefully the, the energy trial will add some, some more data to that. Thanks so much. Just to reiterate, the abemocyclib approval stands where it is approved for one to three lymph nodes positive with grade three, along with tumor size more than or equal to five centimeter, four or more lymph nodes positive. There was a criteria of KI-67, but that has taken that has been taken away by FDA. And also laparib approved in high-risk patient population. Virginia, That's let's, yeah, thanks so much. Let's dive into our locally advanced stage here, if you don't mind going over the algorithm, please. Yeah, absolutely. So these are the patients that will have four or more positive lymph nodes, higher risk. The uh, the Rx bonded trial did not include them. There were earlier trials with a 21 gene recurrence score uh, looked at retrospectively, but there were prospective trials that showed that that, that prognostically and predictively it works regardless of node positivity. The only thing you get from more lymph nodes is a higher risk of recurrence for the exact same recurrence score. So if you had a recurrence score of, of 20 and you had uh, one to three positive nodes versus four nodes or six nodes, the patient with the six nodes and the exact same recurrence score would have a higher risk of recurrence compared to the patient with the one to three positive lymph nodes. But the, uh, but the trials, the prospective trial did not include that. So all of these patients would be offered chemotherapy. We typically give dose dense ACT, you can make an argument to give TC for six cycles, but for these nodes, most of us would be giving an anthracycline. And, and then again, high risk patients. So if they're premenopausal, they'll get ovarian suppression and are candidates automatically for a bemocyclib and if BRCA positive, also a laparib. Virginia, thank you for touching on that. And Rohit, you've mentioned on the abema criteria. A laparib got approved for BRCA positive patients based on Olympia trial which included triple negative breast cancer, which was the majority of the patients, but there were hormone receptor positive patients in this trial, about 18 to 20% were hormone receptor positive. Virginia, in this patient population, the BRCA positive one, do you favor PARP inhibitor over ABEMA or do you find a way to sequence them? So I typically try to sequence them. And there's some, some sets of data that, to keep in mind. There's a data set for Memorial Sloan Kettering suggesting that patients that are BRCA2 positive um, may not have as big a benefit uh, for, from CDK4-6 inhibitors. 
So it seems that CDK4-6 inhibitors may be, uh, or the cancer is resistant to these drugs. And so I wouldn't rely on a CDK4-6 inhibitor for these patients. Huh, for um, BACA2. So, yeah, so practically, uh, uh, and if you see in the metastatic setting, these patients, you're not going to get a median PFS of two, three, four years. You're probably going to get a me median PFS of one or so years because this disease tends to be kind of resistant. Um, now, if you look at the criteria for the for monarchy, patients could have had a delay in starting a bemocyclib, and this kind of gives us the way to sequence these drugs. So what I do is I give a lap rate for the year, and then I will give them a bemocyclib for another two years. This field is rapidly changing, especially you talk about locally advanced and now metastatic. In rapidly changing, talking about ribocyclib, which we are anticipating approval, although the, this is based on Natalie trial, which we are expecting slightly broader uh, approval range as opposed to what we have for abemocyclib. Now, moving along into our metastatic space, we've seen approval for three important drugs here. Virginia, your take in the metastatic space algorithm, please. Yeah, so this is exciting. This was a, a, a place where for a long time we had but one, one and a half drugs, and we were kind of happy with that. And now we were a kid in the candy shop trying to figure out what to do with all of these choices. So first line, CDK4-6 inhibitor. I think that's established a very, very small number of patients that, that we would consider not giving a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Now we're going into second line, and this is where things are a little more complicated. First of all, is the tumor still endocrine sensitive or is it now endocrine resistant? And probably the criterion that we use the most is what was the duration of the CDK4-6 inhibitor? If that duration was more than 12 months or so, I think we, we know that these patients are going to do uh, probably okay on a second-line endocrine therapy, and so we can consider that second-line therapy. If we have a duration of less than 12 months, then we start moving on to cytotoxic therapy with uh, ADC chemotherapy and so forth. So let's take the endocrine sensitive patients. Then in that patient population, we want to look at their genomics. Do they have a, a tumor with an ESR1 mutation, a PIK3CA mutation, or an AKT pathway alteration, and obviously a, a germline BRCA mutation? If they have one of those things, then we want to give a targeted agent. And that's where we start looking at toxicities. Do we want to give a single agent or a combination based on toxicity profile? And then finally, if we don't have any of those things, then we have Everolimus, uh, older and sometimes forgotten drug, but extremely effective. And uh, then you can you can use that in combination with either Exemestin, Provestrant, or so forth. And Virginia, before we go on to endocrine resistant disease, let me dial the clock back a little. Even CDK4-6 inhibitor is upfront. There are three that are approved. We know Pavlocyclib did not meet overall survival. Recent update for Abema showed 13 months of, of improvement in overall survival, but p-value was 0 0.06. Any preference on selecting the CDK4-6 inhibitor upfront for you? So I think overall, all, all three agents have met primary endpoints for their trials. So then you start looking at statistics, and that's where I call it the statistical game, really. Um, is Was one trial underpowered? Was the other trial including patient population that was lower risk? There was a discontinuation rate here and there. Were things not captured, um, information lost, and so forth? So I would say, as, as one statement, that all three are effective drugs. Now, what do I typically do? I use ribocyclib because of the overall survival benefit. But if I had a patient coming to me or a patient that I already had from the, you know, 2015, 16, where I was using palbocyclib, would I switch them? I would not. I would continue palbo. I think it's a perfectly fine medication. Abemocyclib, in my hands, has been a little harder to give because of the diarrhea. And I use it in the adjuvant setting because of the monarchy data. But in the metastatic setting, I tend to favor ribo. Talking about the choice of therapy in the era of personalized medicine. Now, we know we would be checking ESR1 mutation, pic 3 ca AKT. Now, do you check that frontline or when they progress? And is it based on liquid or solid tumor, uh, tumor tissue testing? So that's a that's a great point to make. So when, when a patient is found to have metastatic disease, I always get a biopsy to confirm it. 
It gives me a little bit of time for the patient to understand what's going on. It also tells me what definitively is going on. And so once I get that biopsy, I'll send it for, for NGS and get preliminary results. And that'll be our PIK3CA AKT alterations, which are present in the primary and metastatic tumor. But that's not going to be SR1 mutation status. That will potentially come later on because this is a mutation that builds over time once a cancer becomes um, endocrine resistant. And so I will get a ctDNA testing at the time of progression. And that's going to be my ESR1 uh, status uh, looked at in that patient. And I might find other alterations as well. And thank you for addressing that because ESR1 mutation is a resistant mutation that you'll see more likely in liquid rather than upfront if you were to test it. Virginia, you've touched upon if there is one of these mutations, you have an actionable drug here. However, if there is a co-mutation, AKT, P10, or ESR1, which drug are you going to go after? It's going to come down to toxicities. So do you have any clinical pearls on how to manage some of the toxicities that come along with capivacertib or elicestrin or alpalicid? And there was some nice data presented in uh, at San Antonio looking at the Emerald trial in patients that had co-mutations showing that uh, elicestrin is active in patients that have both an ESR1 and a PIK3CA mutation. And that was reassuring for us. And we've seen this in practice as well. So elicestrin will, uh, it is relatively well tolerated. Or it can have some GI toxicities, mostly a little bit of nausea or so, so forth. But on Emerald, only 8% of patients were on anti-emetics. So that's going to be a small number. But obviously, we can do that if we need to. When we look at alpelicib, uh, I, I would say uh, blood sugars are the, the the biggest limitation. And you know, I live in South Texas. We have a lot of pre-diabetics and diabetic patients, so it's been hard to give. With capivacertib, with uh, surprisingly, pleasantly, surprisingly, uh, there's not as much uh, uh, hypoglycemia, but here we go into diarrhea, um, and we can have a, a little bit of uh, stomatitis as well. So that's something to keep in mind. I think mostly for the diarrhea. Uh, we want to tell patients to have some antidiarrheal at home because they may need to start it. Uh, we also are starting to look at dose escalations the same way we were looking with neuratinib to see if there are any other strategies out there to, to, be, to be used. But at this point, I would just say have your antidiarrheal at home to use as needed. Sticking with the side effect profile, in third or fourth line, we used to rely on chemotherapy heavily. Now, luckily, we have TDXD as well as sasituzumab to use. Now, TDXD, we know, causes some nausea, fatigue, alopecia, and more importantly, the dire complication of pneumonitis, which needs to be very much kept in mind. Talking about sasituzumab, first of all, how do you sequence sasituzumab and TDXD here? And also some clinical pearls and uh, some thoughts on side effect profile of sasituzumab, Virginia. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have the destiny breast of four trial that included mostly ER positive patients. There was only 58 triple negative patients on that trial. So the TDXD data with uh, HR positive patients is, is pretty, pretty good. And so for this patient population, I'll typically give TDXD before I give sasetizumab. But I'll take things into account like toxicity profile. For example, with sasetizumab, you're going to see some uh, neutropenia. And we typically give growth factor on day eight, a long-acting growth factor, and that helps prevent neutropenia. It's so a little bit of diarrhea. Diarrhea hasn't really been an issue for me. It seems to, to be pretty manageable. And we give anti-nausea medications anyway. Uh, if I have a patient that has COPD, that has other comorbidities that increase her risk, you know, some, some uh, renal insufficiency, increase her risk of having ILD, then I'll give sasetizumab first instead of TDXD. So those are the things to keep in mind. Uh, but typically, I'll give TDXD first, sasetizumab second. Rohit, you've mentioned alopecia for TDXD. You can also see alopecia with sasetizumab. That's another thing that we have to worry about in the community. Exactly. And so TDXD alopecia is around 30% with sasetizumab around 50%. Reminder that that's all alopecia, including yes. mild and moderate to severe uh, uh, hair loss. So most of our patients will have that mild to maybe a little moderate hair loss. As we'll continue to utilize these drugs in our community settings, it is very important to keep in mind the side effect profile because it really impacts the quality of life of patients. We have covered a lot here. Well, we were able to manage to cover entire estrogen receptor positive algorithm within 20 minutes. We saw alicestrin, capivacertib, and sasetizumab get approved in 2023. 
giving our patients more treatment options, along with us awaiting ribocyclob approval in adjuvant setting. Virginia, thank you so much for taking the time to go over the current standard of care with us today. For our listeners, let us go over a short recap. In this discussion with Dr. Virginia Kaklamani from UT Health San Antonio, MD Anderson Cancer Center, we have covered the treatment algorithm for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. In early stage, relying on Oncotype DX to dictate who benefits from chemotherapy has been the key from our expander trial. We have learned if a patient, particularly premenopausal, is lymph node positive, they are going to be benefited with chemotherapy regardless of their Oncotype DX score. Then we've also covered the locally advanced disease where agents such as abemocyclib and olaparib continue to play a big role in adjuvant settings. In metastatic space, we had a chance to touch upon three approvals that we saw in 2023 and some clinical pearls around these agents. Thank you for joining us today. Please make sure to check out our triple negative breast cancer discussion with Dr. Ruth O'Regan and her two positive discussion with Dr. Hal Burstein. We are the Oncology Brothers.